Good day and welcome to another session of Cardiac Imaging Agora. In this session, we will review a PET scan to be able to identify ischemia and report it in a meaningful way. Again, we will go over the steps needed to review and understand the totality of findings on a cardiac PET scan like we've done in the, in the first video for this uh, website. We start with the review of transmission and emission images. On the left-hand side, you have the rest images with the CT images superimposed on the perfusion images. Similarly, on the right-hand side, you can see the perfusion images superimposed on the CT images. The purpose of this exercise is to ascertain the complete co-registration uh, of the emission and transmission images and avoid misregistration artifacts. In this instance, we have good registration. The next step is to review the reconstruction planes. And you can see here right away on the left-hand side that on the rest images, the system has identified the heart properly, whereas on the stress images, the system has identified a spot in the GI uh, and misconstrued that as the heart. If we move that X to the, uh, where the heart is, you get the images on the right-hand side, where now we can process them with the proper identification of the myocardium and the left ventricle. Once we process the images, we arrive at the uh, normal display of the stress images on the top and the rest images on the bottom. Starting with the rest images, and remember this is a PET scan, you have a mild perfusion defect involving the inferior wall here. Again, with a PET scan, you should not see attenuation artifacts from the diaphragm. Uh, so any perfusion defect should be uh, considered uh, a re related to uh, decreased blood flow. And on the stress images, you can see here, this defect becomes severe and now it extends to involve the entire inferior wall. Actually, there's absence of perfusion in the entire inferior wall, at least on these semi-quantitative images. The other thing you can see is there is also decreased perfusion in the inferolateral wall here on the, on the short axis, very well seen and also in the, uh, in the inferior septum right here at the basal inferior septum and the basal anterior septum. So this is a quite large severe perfusion defect, extensive involving multi-vessel territory. Also what we see here is the left ventricle dilating from rest to stress, uh, indicating a dilatation during stress. The next step is to transfer what we saw into a 17 segment plot you can see here on the rest images, uh, we identified a mild perfusion defect in the basal inferior and basal inferolateral wall here. On the stress images, there is absence of perfusion in the entire inferior wall. And also there is a moderate perfusion defect in the circumflex territory here in the inferolateral wall and mild in the anterolateral wall. And again, you can see a severe perfusion defect involving the septum, anterior septum and inferior septum. All these were scored to get a sum stress score of 26, a sum rest score of two, and a sum difference score of 24, indicating a severe, large, extensive perfusion defect. The next uh, stop is to uh, review the histograms uh, from which we generate the uh, gated images. On the rest images on the left-hand side, you can see this is a very tight histogram, indicating very nice uh, uh, acquisition of the images with a, a very constant heart rate. On the stress side, you can see the patient here, the histogram is widespread, and the patient went into atrial flutter uh, from the rest to the stress images. Uh, this is important to uh, recognize and identify in case you see a drop or a change in the ejection fraction from rest to stress, and this should be attributed to a heart rate issue rather than a true drop in ejection fraction. We move to the gated images. We display the rest images on the bottom and the stress images on the top. And here again, we can see severe uh, reduction in left ventricular ejection, ejection fraction. Uh, similarly, you can see left ventricular dilatation, rest and stress images with akinesia of the inferior wall in the stress images. The volumes we're dealing with here are end systolic volumes above 200 for the left ventricle, uh, are very important to, uh, as a prognosticator. Uh, when we are generating the report at the end. Again, you can see dilatation of the right ventricle too with uh, some uh, right ventricular uh, dysfunction. We move to the dyssynchrony analysis. And just in this case, just for the purpose of uh, 
uh, illustration you can see on the right hand side I put a normal patient uh, this is not this patient, this is a normal patient showing the contractility curve of the left ventricle uh, of each segment of the left ventricle and rest and stress. Whereas in our patient here, you can see there is poor contractility of all the segments at rest and post stress, uh, uh, all coming together at the same time, but still poorly contractile. Uh, this is important also to note, uh, especially if you get in a situation where you have uh, uh, changes uh, from rest to stress in the contractility, indicating uh, ischemic stunning. Although in patients with ejection fraction under 40%, we do not traditionally do myocardial blood flow. In this instance, we did it. We do it on all the patients, but we choose when we report it. In this instance, uh, I was very impressed by the steel phenomena that happened in the RCA, where we get a ratio under one, indicating a steel phenomenon again. And we have global reduction in myocardial blood flow right here depicted as 1.45 and normal in general is about 1.8 as a cutoff uh, when we start reporting abnormalities in the ratios. The next uh, step is to look at the CT images. Uh, the, two, the dual purpose of the CT images is to identify uh, coronary calcification as you can see in the left-hand system on the, right -hand, on the left-hand side and in the right uh, coronary system on the right-hand side here coronary calcification. The second purpose of this is to identify uh, abnormalities in the lungs, whether you can see tumors, uh, uh, incidental findings that in one of the sessions in the future we'll go over with you and tell you what should be reported and how you should report these, uh, uh, these findings. To the most important part of this uh, whole exercise is to go to generate a clinically meaningful report. Again, we talked about using the AUC uh, criteria Again, you can see here all the AUC uh, criteria for uh, stress testing are listed, and some uh, are not on the AUC uh, uh, list, but uh, we uh, still uh, added them on here. We have amyloid heart disease, you have anomalous coronary arteries, heart transplant, some niche uh, of, uh, diagnosis and some niche uh, diseases that we thought we should capture uh, that were not captured in the AUC. In this instance, it's a patient uh, who's 68 years old, pre-op testing for uh, bilateral knee surgery. He was having actually some uh, uh, reported to the orthopedic surgeon is having some chest pain uh, uh, climbing up the stairs uh, and that the orthopedic surgeon uh, thought he should have uh, a stress test before. So he sent him for a regular and PET scan uh, and the results we've been discussing are the results of the scan done for pre-op uh, risk stratification for a patient with poor exercise capacity who actually is unable to walk on the treadmill. Then the next uh, stop is to, uh, uh, again, report the dose and the time of the dose and what tracer you used. Uh, these are all important uh, for quality assurance and what agent you use for stress testing. Uh, then we move to the clinical side of the report where we have the heart rate at rest, the blood pressures, the, uh, that, the uh, height and weight of the patient, the BMI, uh, medications, uh, prior risk factors for CAD. And then we move here to an important field, at least for pharmacological stress testing for me. The heart rate of this patient was 48 at rest, post-stress was 67. This is uh, a normal finding with regadenosine, and actually I use it as a quality assurance to make sure that patients have received the dose and actually reacted to the dose. You have an increase in heart rate and a drop in blood pressure. That means they got the regadenosine. Uh, we also capture uh, if they have EKG changes or if they had any symptoms uh, right here. The next stop is to uh, uh, evaluate the ejection fraction. You can see here, uh, we coded this ejection fraction as uh, severely reduced. Uh, we uh, code both the rest and stress ejection fraction as well as the TID, and we comment about the wall motions uh, uh, on the uh, rest images. Uh, then we move to the uh, test summary where we have to code now ischemia, not in general, but by territory. In this instance, we coded a area of large ischemia uh, in the RCA territory, large and severe, uh, moderate in the CERG, and mild in the, uh, uh, in the LAD uh, territory. Uh, there were no scar. Uh, the small defect we saw in the rest images, we elected not to report it as scar because we only call scar uh, in cases where we do FTG. And in this instance, we did not do FTG to ascertain the presence of SCAR uh, on, this, uh, on this study. Then the final page in our report and our uh, data capturing uh, exercise, 
is to assign a risk for the scan. So in this instance, we assigned a high risk scan for this. We coded the coronary calcifications for, uh, for this patient. And in this instance, there was no prior study to compare it to, so we did not uh, report that. And this is the report that gets uh, generated after we uh, go through this exercise. It tells you that the study is abnormal. Where are the areas of ischemia in each uh, coronary uh, territory? It tells you about the ejection fraction as well as the size of left ventricle. And finally, it gives you a risk score for the scan. This is a higher scan for multiple reasons, including the area of, the, of ischemia, the extent of the ischemia involving, involving multiple vessels, and the presence of uh, poor ejection fraction and uh, TID. I put here again a reminder for the myocardial blood flow for myself to tell you about the uh, uh, importance of uh, reporting this in general uh, of, uh, on PET since the data is available. This patient went on to have a, a cardiac cath. The cardiac cath showed total occlusion of the RCA uh, in its mid portion right here uh, with actually filling, filling via collaterals from the LAD, but he has also severe LAD disease as well as severe circumflex disease and the ejection fraction was, uh, was uh, coded at 20% uh, on the coronary angiogram. Uh, one, uh, one important uh, issue I wanted to bring up since I looked at the EKG on this patient, uh, you can see Q waves in the inferior wall here, but you don't see a complete absence of perfusion in the inferior wall. Uh, the presence of Q wave is not a uh, uh, indication, a 100% indication that you have scarring. Uh, we, this has been reported before, but just to bring it up again, if you see an EKG with Q-wave, you can still see uh, perfusion. So this might uh, reflect some subendocardial uh, infarct, but not uh, transmural uh, infarction. You can see again, reminded how the inferior wall looked at on the perfusion scans here, just a mild uh, perfusion uh, defect. I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this uh, next uh, one of this session that we have, and we will have uh, more sessions for you uh, in the near uh, future. Thank you.